It gives me the greatest pleasure I have ever had to attend this convention after attending, I don't know how many I've contended now, but this is the one that we've all been looking forward to, the cost of production plus a reasonable profit farm farmers meeting. This little piece of paper here says NFO Cotton Program. I'm talking to an audience today that has very little cotton production in it, but we have a lot of cotton production in the United States. Cotton is produced in 16 different states from California to the Carolinas. This, I'd like to read the goals of the NFO Cotton Program. And those goals are to make every cotton producer a partner at the collective bargaining table, producer contracts which will allow each and every cotton producing member to put a price on his cotton that will reflect the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. I don't know how many of you guys played football, and most of you girls probably haven't, but you know the game. A goal is right out in front of you there, those goal posts, and you're trying to get there to make points. We have experienced a very successful period of time when we have been able to achieve our goals. We've achieved our goals in fat cattle, we've achieved our goals in hogs, we've achieved our goals in cotton, we've been up at the prices that we know that we need to have, but we let them get away, didn't we? We backed off. We just decided maybe the game was over since we had already made a touchdown. Well, let's, let's realize from this that six points doesn't win the ball game. You got to keep going for another touchdown, and you got to keep going until you have got that goal post laid down and won the game. The NFO Cotton Program has enjoyed fantastic success in being a, a pressure, upward pressure on cotton prices. We have started out in 1973 forward contracting cotton a year ahead before we planted the crop for delivery at harvest time, which is this time of the year. We started out in 1973 with contracts at 31 cents a pound, hardly a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. But during that year, our contracts progressed to 95 cents a pound, which did produce a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. 1974, the following year, we started at 41 cents a pound, 10 cents a pound higher was our first contract. Again, this was long before we planted our cotton. That year, we went to the, to the height of 74 cents in contracting. This, all these contracts are before we harvested the crops. 1975, we started at 50-50, which was nearly 10 cents or 9.5 cents a pound higher than the previous year. 1976, and this has been a, quite a year. In 1976, we started at 57.50 with our first contracts and progressed until in August, this is from January of 76, until August of 76, we got to 86 cents on our contracts, forward contracts. At this point, many of the farmers who had been through the experience of 1973 when we got to 95 cents, and they were looking for that dollar, you know what greed is, they were looking for that dollar and their price came down. We hope that we have learned not to do that. Because based on our experience in the past years, from 1973, 74, 75, 76, and I'm going to add one more, 77, which we haven't done yet. But in all of those years, if the farmer had used his cost of production plus a reasonable profit figure to decide what he wanted to sell his cotton for, he could have, during all those years, sold his cotton for 70 cents a pound. He had the opportunity. But in spite of that fact, in 1973, farmers in the United States 
took an average price of 46 and a half cents. Average. I think probably the best thing to bring up now is the progress in 1976 and why we were able to make that move. You have to tie all commodities together, and I'm going to press on your soybean growers and, far and grain farmers in a little bit. In 1976, we were at a low at the beginning of the year. We were below our cost of production. But in 1975, the NFO farmers, who had not contracted early, instead, we put our cotton into the warehouses and decided we had to do something about prices. And we started stair-stepping the sale of 1976 crop cotton out of warehouses. And during that same period of time that we were stair-stepping and selling the 75 crop during the 76 fiscal year, we tied in our contracts for 1976 crop. We made 31 contracts ranging from the 57 and a half cent level to 86 cents. And I'd like to read for you from an industry publication. People were looking at each other, wondering what made the price go up. And this was their answer that was in this industry paper. It said, most of the price advances have been led by old crop contracts. That was us. And with new crop contracts being inserted each time. And that's what we were doing. It can be done. It has been done in cotton. It can be done in all commodities. We, we need to get to the point we don't have to stair step, that we can tell them what that price is. But before you do that, you have to put the commodity together and give us the opportunity to build a price up to the cost of production figure so that you can contract your commodity. They're going to price ourselves out of the market by getting too high prices. You've all heard that. In 1968, 69, 70, and 71, synthetics literally took the fiber market away from the cotton farmer. During that period of time, the cotton farmer was taking 25 cents a pound for cotton. Synthetics were selling for a dollar and 65 cents a pound. It wasn't the price, was it? In 1975, the industry of fi synthetic fibers spent $290 million on advertisement and research. Farmers spent $8.4 million. If that $8.4 million had been spent through NFO, we wouldn't have even had to advertise, would we? We're in a position now that world usage of cotton is definitely up. American usage of cotton is up. You're beginning to see cotton back in the, back in the stores and back on the market. Companies like Janssen, Manhattan, uh, Montgomery Ward is going coming out all out for cotton. Sears and Roebuck, the retail stores are beginning to sell cotton, and we feel like we're really bullish on the cotton market. But we ain't going to get a price unless we tell them what we have to have, and unless we put it together and insist on that price. But worse than that, what we're looking at now is, in spite of a shortage of cotton and a usage up, we have low prices in grain, soybeans, and all other crops. And in those 16 states that grow cotton, they also grow soybeans and grain. And to give you an example of what is happening, from a small county, Cochise, Arizona, we have in the last four weeks had mailed to us 15 new memberships and sign agreements for sale and authorization for sale on cotton from, excuse me, 
from for cotton. And these are all grain farmers. What I'm saying is this, we've got to work on all commodities. Everybody's got to go home and use that Minuteman system and get it signed up. Let's go home and get the job done. Thank you. To you, Alan Scrow, the head of the hog division department. Alan? Thank you, Arne Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, and fellow members of the NFO. I'm not going to take a whole lot of your time this afternoon. We've had 13 meetings to get into an in-depth discussion in the department. So I'm going to summarize about five points and take about as many minutes to get it done. The first one is that I'm just happy to come back to the state of Wisconsin, which is my home state. This is where I came from. I want to say this. When we had the convention in Milwaukee the last time, I was back teaching school and practicing efficiency and getting bigger and more productive. I learned one or two things since then. So we come back to this town and establish cost of production figures, target prices, and a system and method to get there. That is the purpose of the organization. That is what it was founded for. Make no mistake about it, the bottom line is profit in your hog operation and nothing else. Think of that. Isn't that why we're here? I sat back and, I sat back and reflected on this convention and in the process of it, I have decided that in years past, we have been so involved with battles that we forgot what the war was about. And I'm going back to win the war. And I hope we're going to be able to do it in 77. We want to, when we leave this convention, to establish that hog structure in every single county that raises hogs. We all have copies of this. We know how we're going to do it. The approach you go to when you go to a non-member hog producer, to a large hog producer, a small hog producer, as you take your coffee pot, you get four of them together in a meeting, and you sit down and discuss your price structure, your operation, your contracts, and the direction that you're going to go. And you do it with all of them. Large, small, don't make any difference. You sit down with them and talk with them. You have established a cost of your operation, which was in the neighborhood of about $44, is what you put down in your cost of operation figures, to plug in a fair price for the feeder pig producer of about approximately $35, the 320 target price on corn brought us in the neighborhood of the 5350 figure. We're going to have that figure in 77 if we take the steps as were outlined in the meetings. I've got the confidence in the producers of this country, if they've got the confidence in myself, then I can almost assure you that you're going to be looking at cost of production figures. We have to develop that mutual confidentiality to get it done. So looking ahead to the next year, I think we're in good position. I think we can handle the job. The industry representatives were impressed with the dedication and the uh, feeling that you people had to do the job. They were not opposed to the concept. And I think, I think 1977 is going to be fantastic. All right, uh, the next we have is a gentleman who has done a great job and a very difficult job that has a department that's been moving, but also a department that's ready to really move. By putting together the production, you'll find out. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Ed Groff, the director of the dairy department. Ed.
Mr. President, delegates, officers, and friends, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 10 years ago, we made history. This convention will soon be history, but you're going to leave your mark on it. And we'll look back and think more about the history we made in the coming years. Last night, I got to thinking what we really did. Does anyone in this room, can you ever recall when the old system ever went out and said, this is what the farmers need, and this is what we're going after for them, our members, that this is what we're going to drive for. Did you ever hear a cooperative manager or a cooperative system ever make that statement? Did you ever hear an independent buyer ever say, our members, our producers out there need this, and then go out and have a goal set to try and help them? Did you ever hear of the federal government ever set a target price and say this is what it should be and now we're going out and do something to get this for the farmer. You never did and you never will and you know that. Yesterday when you set your price goal, it was the way that you did it was so important and historic. You didn't see anyone sitting in those meetings from the Green Bay Cheese Exchange, no one from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the Board of Trade, no one from the Department of Agriculture, or none of those so-called experts that read about your plight and tell you what to do but still have the lily-white hands. The historic fact was it was you that got the calluses on your hands and who owned the food first that made that decision yesterday. That's the historic part of it. You did something for you. The rest of them have done something to you. You don't believe that? I'll show you what they did to you this morning. A short time ago, George Getschow from the Wall Street Journal wrote an article, and he said, as organized marketplaces go, the National Cheese Exchange is anything but impressive. And you're sitting close to it today, folks. It's housed in a small rented warehouse in an industrial section of town that even the cab drivers have trouble finding. It consists of a cramped, dimly lit room with a large blackboard, a couple dozen uncomfortable wooden chairs, and a few battered phone booths. Trading is conducted for a half hour each week on Friday morning. The exchange has just 44 members, and only a handful of them show up for the trading sessions. That place and those people this morning dropped the price of milk by dropping the price on barrel cheese by a half cent a pound, which is a nickel a hundred on all the milk that goes into the barrel cheese, which will be reflected on the prices of the grade A farmers from coast to coast. They did something to you this morning, and they've been doing it quite frequently recently. Also, an article by George Anthon pointed out the, uh, some of the same things happening on the Board of Trade, and the past vice president said this should be abolished. You set your goal, and your goal yesterday, of course, was a stepping stone. What, the, uh, what you do and the leaders of NFO do in the next week and the next 90 days is going to be very important. I'm going to ask you to put upward pressure on the market. I'm going to ask you to make the processors react to the movement of supply. Experience has shown us that when we did this for 22 months, the prices moved upward. It also has shown us that when, that when we stood still, a downward effect and pressures were applied to the market and prices dropped. From 1960, the early 1960s till today, the same thing is happening. 22 months, of course, of that price rise. And then Last February, when the members of the National Farmers Organization met and said, we've had enough, we're going to stop the drop, the price did turn around, 
and the reports came back that the experts had red faces. They didn't say what happened, but they had red faces because they expected the prices to continue to drop, and they turned around. We're in a new ballpark tonight. Reminds me of what we've gone through. We know that the processors have reacted, and we know that companies have fought back. It's like a little story. We weren't totally experienced. We were like the man who went to Africa on the safari. He was going to do some big game hunting. He walked away from his camp with his rifle in his hand, and he came face to face with a big lion. He immediately was going to pull the gun up, but the, the butt of the gun got under his shoulder, and the lion made a sudden leap at him with his mouth open and his claws extended. The man couldn't shoot, but the lion jumped right over his head. It scared the man, so he went back to camp and he said, I've got to correct this. He practiced pulling that rifle up to his shoulder where he would never miss again. And he walked around the bush and there was that lion practicing short jumps. So they've been trying to counteract what we've been doing. I said we're in a new ballpark today. I have a letter from a major company on the podium with me tonight or this afternoon. And although I've been able to tell you before that the buyers of our products are not going to object to paying you a fair price when you make them pay it, providing you organize yourself strong enough and make all of their competitors pay that price. And I ask a representative of the Borden Company to come here today if he were willing to make that statement public. He apologized, but he said, no, we can't make it, but I'll send you a letter. And you can express our views. He said at that point, I'm not going to encourage you to reproduce this letter by the thousands because we're going to present it formally in the next couple of weeks. And one of the things he said was this. Let me make our position clear. We have no objection to any form of competition as long as that competition is required to pay the same price for raw milk. And he said, we know what the National Farmers Organization is trying to do, set prices based on cost of production and a fair margin of profit. And we are not objecting to that. In fact, the markets are opening up for the farmers to put the production together in unlimited supply to go into the markets we could turn it upside down, not in 90 days, but 30 days, with the opportunity that we have right now if the farmers will just put it into the system that we have. <clears throat> this, cert this convention certainly should be serving notice on the processors. Can you imagine how they must have gloated and felt a few years ago? when we appeared to be tearing ourselves apart, and they don't see it now. And they know that we're going to demand these prices. The commodity Minuteman structure is going to be implemented in the dairy program in the very near future. And I'm asking all of the dairy producers from the counties that you represent to stop at the dairy booth directly behind you as you walk out and pick up a minimum of four brochures. We have two types out there, the one from last year and this new one. I want you to take that home, and Monday morning, I want you as leaders to begin making the calls to any leaders that are at home. They may be on committees. They may not be on committees. They may be officers. They may not and call them together and figure out how many dairy farmers you have in your county. Order the brochures that you need so that every dairy farmer in every one of these counties can have one or two of these brochures put in his hand, not mailed to him, 
but put in his hand by you or one of the other leaders. Begin this immediately Monday morning, and on top of that, on the back side of this, I want you to write the price goal so that when you go to that farmer, you will not just have something there that you, when he says, what did you pay or what did you receive, you say, this is the goal that we're after. In other words, dairy farmers, <clears throat> you're proud, aren't you? Aren't you a group of proud people? Shouldn't you be proud? Yes, you are, and you've got every right to be proud. I want to issue this challenge. You shook this country from coast to coast 10 years ago when you left that convention, and as Orrin Lee Staley told you last night, they didn't think the decision you made here would be carried out. They didn't think you dared to do it, but you did. They possibly think that you won't have the ability and the determination and the guts to go out and tell them that this is a price goal that we're after and you're determined enough that you're going to start Monday morning and get enough production into this organization that the companies as Borden and Kraft and right on down the line are going to say, yes, we will pay it. Thank you. Next, it's going to be a great opportunity for all of us to hear. Wait a minute. Vince, did you have an announcement? Fink, are you ready? Okay. Well, as Mr. Staley said, I haven't spoken for several years to you. Now your luck ran out. <laughs> but it wasn't because I felt sorry for you that I haven't spoken on the last few conventions, but rather that I felt sorry for myself. I really never believed there was a topic for me to talk on. When, after all, the president gives the state of the organization message, each one of the department heads cover their department, my long suit was organizing, or at least I thought it was, and so there was no way for me to speak in my own opinion because there was nothing left to talk about without me gutting their speech. So about all I had left to talk about was Don Munn. <laughs> Guess I'm going to miss him today. But I did feel that this year, as a result of going out and organizing a few nights ago, I did have something to say. I organized the joints around the hotels down there. <laughs> I didn't get to organize the Voom Voom room because that was closed by the time I got there. <laughs> but I talked to a lot of people in those places. And I took what I heard very, very seriously. And the reason I did is because most of them were pretty full of that truth serum by that time. And I believe that I came closer to hearing what people actually thought than I would at any other time. And some of the things that I heard, I understand it's a minority, but some of the things that I heard scared me very, very much. You'll recall that Wednesday night, President Staley, in his union or, uh, organizational message, outlined the structure to you, where it stood, and how we were getting along, and ready to go the distance, ready to pull the trigger. I thought it was one of the most terrific speeches that I had ever heard. And it seemed that most certainly he succeeded 
in letting the people realize that it had to be done, that they had to do it, and it had to be done now. It seemed to sober some people, and the things that I heard annoyed me no end, because I believe that we need every single one of you to the fullest extent to do what we have to do, in my opinion, within the next 30 days. I was hearing despair. I was hearing alibis. And I believed that unless we knocked those out, our chance wasn't too good. And so, believe it or not, I ask Mr. Staley for the opportunity to speak here. I want to correct some of those wrong impressions that I think may be among some of you. I think some of you are not going to like what I got to say, but I think nevertheless it's got to be said. So I decided by the time I get through speaking, you're either going to be ready to go to work or you're going to hate me. The things that I heard, well, I hope to get it done, but my county is pretty dead, and nothing's going to happen in my county. We haven't got a man to do it. Well, I argued with people on that first. Uppermost question in my mind was, who was dead in that county? Or who was really killing it? But then I started to explain to them the difference between now and years ago when we started organizing. It is so simple that it's almost beyond grasp. And really, that confuses us the most sometimes when we deal with simplicity. Just as when we first started organizing for collective bargaining, businessmen attending our meetings, would invariably say, it sure sounds like a good idea. What's the gimmick? And that kind of is the impression that I got while I was organizing the joints, between dances, that is. So I wanted to get into that and explain to you how simple it is today to go the rest of the distance compared to what it was when we started. Mr. Staley pointed out to me that I was an organizer. Now, I'd like to g give you an idea of how the organization was built. Now, you see the idea that was conveyed here. There's nobody there to talk to anybody to get the farmers going. Well, when we started organizing, or at least the organizing that I did, and I think it was the case with all of them, there was nobody in any county that I went into. Not one single member after I left my own county. And the going was tough. So what did we do? We went into a county. We started talking to pe people day in, day out. And in most of the counties that I organized, I didn't have a single member the first three or four days. Maybe in about a week or 10 days, I'd have a few members. And usually, I found a guy that would help me. Within several weeks, I had a few more members and more people that were ready to, to help. And then by the time we chartered the county, it didn't make any difference where we went, on the street corners, in the restaurants, the taverns, whatever. All you could hear was NFO and collective bargaining. This is the way it was built. 
But now the reason that I want to point out the simplicity of it is that it was one man going into a county where there was no activity, where they hadn't even heard of collective bargaining and didn't even believe in it. As far as they were concerned, supply and demand set the price and absolutely nothing else could affect it and that it was even wrong that farmers should try to. That was a general attitude. Now here is why I have such great faith in that we're going to get it done. Because in every county that has production, a meaningful production, we have organization. Now I started to tell them that they had a hundred in each county and some of them wanted to back off of that. So I backed down to 25. Now there isn't any county of any size with any amount of production in it that doesn't have 25 NFO members. 25 people who know what the score is. 25 people who know that this is what we're going to have to do or it's the end of our way of making a living the welfare of our family, and in my opinion, the destruction of the economy of the entire United States. Now, if we can just get those 25 people to take upon themselves the responsibility of starting to talk to somebody, how fast will it go compared to a total stranger going into a county? But I heard men say, well, there won't no use me saying anything. Nobody will listen. Brother, you better believe they didn't want to listen to me. I hate to talk about myself or myself in this plan. But in order to show it to you, really, I'm my own situation is the only one I know. And there are a lot of them that have done more or as well as I have. They're multiplied by the hundreds. But they didn't want to listen to me. Farmers were much, much more clannish then, say 20 years ago, than they are today. Actually scared of a stranger. And every stranger that came into a rural community was considered a slicker. You're going to tell me that you don't have the same opportunity to talk to your neighbor and people you've known all your life and people who know you, the same opportunity that I had to go into a totally new area where nobody knew me? You're kidding yourself and you're making excuses for not doing what you know you should do. But they tell me they're tough out there today. You think those people are tough. You should have been on the original firing line. You should have heard what they told us then, or at least what they told me. Virtually every new area that I went into, I was a card-carrying communist. Now, can you find it much tougher to buck than that, get started talking to people when they think that you're a communist? But I was even worse than that in some people's eyes. I was a gangster out of Chicago. I was an organizer from labor out there to put the farmers together in an organization to hold their prices down so that labor could buy food cheaper. You're laughing. This is the absolute truth. And there are people in here who will verify every single word. I had one meeting in the very first county that I organized was to be held in the city hall. The steps were about as high as this stage, and the auditorium was to the back of it, 
Whenever I set up a meeting, I always saw to it that I was there 45 minutes ahead of time. So if anybody did come early, that I could visit with them and keep them together that they wouldn't walk out. Nearly all my meetings were set for 8 o'clock at night. This particular night at 8 o'clock or nearly 8 o'clock, there wasn't one single soul in that hall except me. And about 8 o'clock, one man walked in. And he says, hey, what's going on here? There's a guy standing out there on the step that tells everybody that comes up not to go in there because they're going to be tagged communists if they do. Well, I rushed out there immediately. And I stood beside him and visited with him till the rest of the people that were coming up got inside. And I don't think I have to tell you what organization he belonged to. On another occasion in Minnesota, I had set up a meeting in a town, got telephone call that if I opened that meeting, I would be arrested immediately for un-American activities and would be thrown in jail. Well, it never happened. But apparently, they did their job before the meeting started. Only one man came to that meeting, and that wasn't the guy to arrest me. When you're organizing, realize that you have a problem as serious as the farm problem was. That tears your heart out. And a lot of things at the time when they're happened don't seem so great. And yet, when you look back on them later, then they seem funny. And I later gained an awful, awful big satisfaction out of that meeting. Just one man came. It added to my record. I had 100% sign up. And the reason I say I'm proud of it now, because it's the only meeting I ever did have 100% sign up. In South Dakota, for those of you that don't know the state or the terminology, there's what they call the West River Country. I was to speak at the first meeting that was held in the West River Country, but it was during a holding action. I received a call, and many members did, that if I showed up, I was going to be tar and feathered. The members who set the meeting up took it seriously enough that I had a bodyguard of eight men with arms to protect me when I went there. They believed it. Nothing happened. But the threat was there, nevertheless. It was that way always, continuously on down the line. And it's unbelievable what you could get criticized for. I was called a professional because uh, they saw me make a speech and I didn't take a drink. That was critical. And I noticed there isn't any here either. And the reason I didn't take one, because there wasn't anything to drink. I used to hold a meeting at night, go out during the daytime, call on the people who had been at the meetings the previous night. Got much of the enrollment that way. But it was in winter. And this particular day, it was snowy. I did wear my suit, which I always did when I organized. But I put on four buckle over shoes and coveralls. The meeting that we were to have that night was to be held in a legion hall. And when we got there, no heat or no way to generate any. 
And all of the people that were there at the meeting didn't take their coats off, didn't take their gloves off, and really kept their ear flaps down too. And I was cold too. So I just thought out of a matter of politeness, I asked them whether it'd be all right with them if I kept my coveralls on. The next day, it was all over the area that I had tried to fool the people into believing that I was a farmer. It was wrong for me to make the same effort to stay warm that they were using. And the opposition could change overnight. One day it would be one story, and if that wasn't doing the job, the next day it would be totally opposite. Now many of you have the idea that I was one of the founders of the organization. Wrong. Many of you had the idea that I was a driving force in getting it started. Wrong. I had to be talked to same as everybody else. And I hate to disillusion you because sometimes I enjoy the overrating that I get. And it's pretty much as I heard Dizzy Dean say at one time when somebody was talking to him about his accomplishments. He said, well, it's always been that way. And it was basically Missouri boys that were coming up into Iowa starting the organization there. And it was a Missourian that held the first meeting in my county. But for a day or two before that meeting, you see it had been advertised, the story was going around that all it was was the 40-acre guys out of Missouri coming up into the Iowa hoping to get the Iowa boys to pull their chestnuts out of the fire. Little bitty farmers that in the Iowa farmer's opinion should go anyway. You better believe those Iowa boys were proud farmers. In fact, most of them didn't believe that there was anything growing anywhere other than in Iowa. And nine out of 10, if you'd have put them in a car and taken them away from home 25 miles and dumped them, they'd have been lost. Probably never come back. But there was an attitude that they had. But that night to that meeting, five of us went together in one car. None of the five of us farmed any less than 800 acres. Maybe not big today, but 20 years ago, you better believe that was size. It was kind of a birds of a feather flock together thing. All five of us joined the NFO that night. Well, by next morning, 10 o'clock, when I usually arrived at the coffee hole where we lied to each other, the propaganda had preceded us. And the only thing that I heard all day long that this was only for the big guys and the reason that they were wanting it was to raise the price so that we could buy out the little guys. Now get the point, the complete opposite from the day before. That's how the propaganda forces were working, but we were organizing. Now I think the real catcher in it that I want to explain to you why it is so simple. As I've already told you, I was not a founder of the organization. I was a farmer that realized something had to be done. I did not believe that they would ever be able to organize the entire United States. But I was willing to let them try it. Get the point? I was willing to let them try it. Now me, them. Oh yes, I felt I had a responsibility in my own county to help there. And I worked as a county organizer because I did hope it would go 
I did hope they would get it organized, but I don't think at that time I believed that they would. I didn't make out any county organizer sheets or reports. Didn't like reports. How many of you have heard that? Or said it yourself? Rather than out make out reports, I rather paid the expenses myself. And I think I did probably a pretty good job as a county organizer. We had the Minuteman pack at that time. I believe there were five memberships in it. And that's what the guy that organized gave me, one of those Minuteman packs. And I thought I was supposed to fill it. So I did and went back to the meeting the next night and gave it to him, he gave me another one. And I didn't know you couldn't write five new members a day, so I did it. That isn't that hard. I was where I was known, but I'll guarantee you they didn't join right off the bat or the first time I talked to them. But it wasn't tough by working at it. I wasn't an organizer. I had never organized anything in my life. Just plain common sense. If we were in trouble, as a method that we could use if we'd make it work to solve that problem. That was about it. Anybody could understand that, couldn't they? It wasn't hard to sell. And the need is even more critical than it is today. I mean, is today more critical than it was then? Because then we still had hopes that the government would solve it for us. A lot of hope. Because we had just left the period when we had 90% of parity and we believed that all we had to do is change the administration and we'd have it right back. And I was very much annoyed to hear Governor Lucy and the congressman from New York extend the hope that it's going to be done. Don't hang your hat on that one. Now, I know they're sincere. I know that they meant it. And I'm reasonably sure that they thought it was going to be done. But I've listened to that crapola every two years since 1956. And all I ever got out of it was to see it get worse. One of the toughest times that I had in organizing in Minnesota was the day Orville Freeman was appointed Secretary of Agriculture. He was governor of Minnesota at that time. And for a matter of a few weeks, I had great difficulty in talking to a farmer to do, about doing something to solve a problem because I got the same words all the time. We've got our own boy in there now. Our own boy is in there now. He's going to solve it for us. Well, we're at an anniversary date here today Ten years ago, across the street here, at 3.30, the NFO membership voted a holding action. By 5.30, 20 minutes from now, 10 years ago, 20 minutes from now, Orrin Lee Staley and I had a notice from the Attorney General of the United States that we had just better have our butt in his office at 9.30 Monday morning. And at the time, when we about had that holding action won, I think we were there. Our own boy slapped an injunction on us to keep us from getting that price. Now, I've seen it that way continuously from government since that time. And I believe that the people mean it. But I also know that it is an utter impossibility for them. 
They're not going to do it because they won't be permitted to do it. We're still governed by the economists of the United States. They're the influence. And the congressman telling you that the American farmer was voted the man of the year and keep it up. That, I thought, was one of the big jokes I heard today. Because they want you to continue producing, or I think right along with the so-called citation, is the fact that we were producing cheap. We got the award of SAP of the year. And please continue to be so. We're being governed, or the policy will be influenced and guided by the economists. And they believe that the greatest thing for the economy is cheap food. And they're going to see to it, if you leave it to them, that they get it. They do not understand that they are destroying the United States itself, that they are taking it into anarchy. I don't believe much in them. Maybe I should tell you a story about them, a true story, absolutely true. In 1860, in England, the sciences formed an academy. It was called the Academy of Sciences. They would not recognize the economists and the statistici statisticians as sciences or scientists and wouldn't let them in. But they held their meeting of the Academy of Science each year and each year elected a new president. But in the early 70s, 1870, an economist made such a big splash with the statistics that he had put together and the conclusions that he drew and pointed out what was going to happen to the economy of England and to London itself was so amazing that that year they took them in to the Academy of Science and elected this one man as president of the Academy of Science. Now the reason that his findings were so startling, he had pre predicted that in about 15 years or in about 1890, the people would starve le start leaving London and by 1903, there would be nobody left in London. And the reason that he gave for it, according to his figures and the statistics he had put together, that by 1903, the horse manure on the streets of London would be seven feet four inches deep. And in my opinion, they're still behind that pile of manure. And that's all they see. It's not going to be done. You have to do it. All right, let's get back again to my own individual effort of organizing. You better believe that I didn't want to leave my county. And I don't think I would have, except for one man that kept hounding me and maybe almost shaming and tricking me into it. But I went. But there's a man crowding me that got me to do it. And once I started, I never quit. Now I leave the evaluation to you 
how much I, good I did. But as an individual, I know that I did a lot to build the organization. The point I want you to understand, that you individually can help the organization an enormous amount. If just five of you get out and work, how far ahead you are of where I was when I entered those counties, way ahead. If 25 of you get off of your duffer, you can upset a county in 10 days' time. They will join. There is a survey that points out that 92% of the farmers today believe that collective bargaining is their only solution. But somebody has to ask them. And all we seem to be ready in some areas now is to take in you who members. You know what a you who member is? You who sign me up. And they are there. I have in a very short period myself signed up two you who members. People who came to my farm, into my home, and asked to join. Is anybody going to convince me there aren't some around there that would join if we went out and asked them? And I'm surprised that there are that many, because not one single one of you joined on your own accord. It took one of your fellow farmers to come to you, to explain it to you, and to ask you to join, and then you joined. But if we'd have sat there for 10 years, the guys that ask you, or 15 or 20, you wouldn't be members either, would you? You didn't join because you're smarter than the rest of them. You didn't understand any more in collective bargaining than they did. But we never finished the job. We didn't go to the rest of them and do it. So the point I'm trying to make you Look what we succeeded in doing by just one man going into a county, totally strange, totally new. What can happen in your own county if you really get out and decide that you're going to contact every farmer and do it systematically? How many, many like me would there be working if you did that? But that wasn't the only thing that annoyed me. After I had this point across in my efforts to organize, the next thing I heard, it's pretty hard to go out there and tell a man to join so he can take 50 or 100 or a dollar less. That is just so much plain BS. It's just simply not true. And if you're using it, you're alibying. You are ducking your responsibility and hoping that somebody else will believe that. But maybe you do really believe it. If you do, it's only because you've said it so many times that you've convinced yourself. I know that the stories are out there. And I had a man tell me that very thing that had his last year's soybeans on exactly the same contract that mine were on. And I got 11 cents above the market that I could have gotten at my home elevator for those soybeans. Now, I checked the very day that the organization sold them for me. They went to Farmland Industries, about three miles from where I live. 
Had I gone to the elevator, it would have been two miles. But had I taken them to that elevator, the elevator would have sold them to the same place. I'd have got 11 cents less. The elevator would have had a 11 cents cut. And by the way, the deductions are off of this too. And I just should have been happy. And yet a guy with his beans on that same contract tried to tell me that we were a quarter under the market. It is an out and out lie. My last year's corn crop for sold the same way for six cents a bushel more than I could have gotten at home. I know that we shouldn't sell the program on these little advantages, but it's there nevertheless. And there may be an occasion when for some reason or other it doesn't work out that way. But in most cases it does. I want to tell you about cattle, again, in my home area. This happens to be the fearless leader of our county, our county president, Gene Johnson. Pretty good-sized cattle feeder. And the very first year that we had our contract, and this is some time ago, he told me at the end of that contract that for one year, by going through NFO, he had received enough more than he would have received at that same market where this plant is that we sold to, to buy a Cadillac. I asked him whether he'd go and buy a Cadillac. No, he said, as county chairman, I wouldn't dare drive one, or we'd really be in trouble. So he said, I bought a truck. I checked with Gene last night, really for permission to tell this. And Gene told me it hasn't been any different any year since then. And he said it throughout those four or five years that there was only one time when one truckload of cattle he thought might have brought as much or maybe a little bit more at the market. He says he's gaining two ways. He's gaining on price and an awful lot on grade because he says his cattle are grading continuously higher through this contract than they look on the hoof. That man's a cattleman. He knows what he's talking about. But let me give you one from the other side. We had a contract within 100 miles of Missouri, I mean Kansas City, on hogs. A ter this is some time ago. Terrific contract. The reason the contract was as good as it was is because the deal made was, well, let me go back a little. This packer was getting his hogs from the Kansas City market. So what was happening, the farmers were hauling past his plant, paying the trucking to Kansas City. Then he was buying the hogs and bringing them back, paying the commission and paying the trucking. And the contract made was that we would split that difference with him. He was to have part of the advantage, our members get the other advantage. And I happened to be one who was sent down there to explain the contract and to bring the participation together. I forget what the exact difference was. It seems to me it was supposed to be 75 cents above the Kansas City market. But let me use a dollar, just for example. So this is the way it was explained. Your hogs will bring at this plant under our contract one dollar a hundred more than the Kansas City top. The contract got started, was going good, and one day I got a letter from a man down there that I respect very much as a man, as a member. But that letter called me more different kinds of SOBs than I had ever begun to realize existed. And the second paragraph was to explain how many 
of those different kinds of SOBs we had in the Corning office. Then he told me what the problem was, that he had been told he was going to get a dollar hundred more than Kansas City top, but that in reality he had gotten, I believe it was two dollars and thirty cents a hundred less. And then he explained once more to me what kind of an SOB I was for what I had said. But the man was an honest man. He included his sales slip. He included a photostatic copy of the check that he had received. And he included a clipping out of the Kansas City paper on the hog market. It was fortunate that it was that kind of a clipping because it was not just one that said the top, hog top, such and such amount, but it gave the top price for every weight category. His hogs had weighed 320 pounds. And in reality, he received almost 50 cents a hundred more than the top at Kansas City. But that's what he failed to do. Look at the weight. I was going to go down and talk to him because I valued the man, his efforts and so forth. And then I decided it's too slow. I was going to have to write him a letter. I have marked in red the things that applied to his sale, explained it to him, and sent it back. And in my life, I have never seen such an apologetic letter as I received from him. A man that I have not seen since then, because as he put it, he would be ashamed to look me in the eye. The man was honest. But the story was over the whole area and is still there today. The damage is done. Now those are things that may have happened along the way, totally mistake. There can be things and are things where things didn't work out right and it actually figured out that way. But we're past those days. In that speech that Mr. Staley gave you the other night, he outlined it, how thoroughly the whole thing is computerized. Nobody else in the world in farm commodities has anything like it. And I'd like to refer once more to the comparison that he used to illustrate it, the building of our organization. He was pointing out the Wright brothers and their plane, that the first one just went from the top of the ground down to the ground. A lead ball would have done that. And every scientist was telling the Wright brothers and everybody else that nothing heavier than air could fly. But the scientists admitted, yeah, there were the geese and the ducks and the birds. And but the reason they could, they had been given special God-given talents that man didn't have. But the Wright brothers didn't understand that. So they built another plane, and that one flew 146 feet. By any man's standard, a total flop. But as Orrin Lee outlined it to you, that now, through constant improvement, we have planes that can go 2,000 or over 2,000 miles an hour. It is possible today in a plane to leave, to watch the sunrise in New York City at 8 o'clock in the morning, fly to Los Angeles and see the sun come up again. That's speed. That's improvement, and we've had that and have it now 
in our system, the NFO program. All we need now is the crew to fly it. You are the crew, each and every one of you. It is your responsibility, you personally. The non-member is not our problem. I think it's the member. The non-member is ready to go when we as individual members are ready to get out there and lead him in and let him know he's wanted. I'm very, very scared of the economy of the United States. I believe that it could totally flop in 90 days or on very short period of short notice. I'm not telling you that it's going to, but the possibility is there. And I'd like to remind you that in 1929, the President of the United States got on the air on Friday afternoon and told the people of this nation who were a little worried that the economy of the United States had never ever been in better condition. And yet I believe it was what on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, she nosedived the crash. And we didn't get over it till years and years later. We're ready to crash. And I believe that it is very possible that if we don't get it done in the next 90 days, we may never, ever have another chance. The raw materials are the basis of the economy. And I believe that they've been exploited about as far as it can be without destruction. And once that happens, I don't care how high to heaven you scream, if it's every farmer in the United States, it's too late. We have to do it while the wheels of industry are still turning, while people are still employed, and while the economy is considered at least in a position to go on. If we were to have every bit of the food in the United States held in a holding action after a collapse, the best we could do is starve the people to death. I've heard farmers say, well, what we need is a good depression. And that happens, boys. It's all over. But with 25, 50, or 100 men in each county, it's unbelievable what can be done if you'll but face the responsibility or needle somebody else to go to work. Stick with them like that guy did with me. Don't let them off the hook. Guarantee you the guy working on me didn't let me off. And you'd be amazed what can be done. Individually, and I'm talking about you, not the guy sitting in the next seat to you, I'm talking to the guy sitting in your seat. If you will be responsible, I don't even believe it'd take 90 days. Now I went to work because I did it for myself, because it needed to be done, and for my family. But I realized that I couldn't help myself without saving your hide, too. I've put in over 200 months steady. I believe now is the time that every one of you owe me one and do a little bit for my family. And those of you 
all of you. You're either going to be part of the solution by helping or failing to do that. You are the problem. You are the guy that's destroying rural America. And if there's one thing I would not want on my conscience ever, if we should let it go into collapse, is to have to feel that my irresponsibility was even in part responsible for the destruction of the opportunity of your family, your kids. You better think about it. It's later than you think. I'd like to again, maybe to give you a little other slant on it. Quote your national vice president, Devon Woodland, who in my opinion made one of the most profound statements on why he decided to help. He said that after he realized what the problem was, that there was a solution, he asked himself the question, who's going to do it? And then ended up with, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? I thank you. Now you better mean it. If you don't mean it, let's be honest about it then start booing. Okay, I'll take your word. I want to stay here, and if everybody will stay put just for a moment, I want to tell why that I think it's so important. We've come to this convention from every corner of this nation. We're the only organization with the structure nationwide with a delivery system that can force the large companies of this country that buy nationwide to compete. We're the only organization with the courage to wage the economic battle. As I said, people could have 100% of the production put together in an organization but I don't believe there's another organization in this country that have the courage to wage the economic battle then. I really don't, folks. I don't know of one. And now to the strategy of what we do. I told the people this morning that met at 8 o'clock that we're calling the shock troops, I guess, that are going to do many things. They had a specific assignment. And I said, I want us to hit the road so hard Monday morning, turning this country upside down, that I want us to take advantage of what I know the situation will be. And that is people that might attack us in the press, or companies that would fight and design new strategy, or whatever it might be. But you know, it's getting close enough to Christmas and close enough to New Year's, a lot of those people are going to be on vacation. And they probably won't be back till the 5th of January in a lot of cases. And then they'll have to get their own work in order. And when they come back, I'd like to have our production united in this country to where the large companies have to come to us to get part of their needs at least. 
And then I can guarantee you we won't be under the market. We'll be leading the market. I can tell you that the dairy department has got an amazing contract right now that they could fill from a, another critical area that we haven't talked about. But in order to be competitive in the area they take it out, we've got to have more production in there to take advantage of it. I haven't heard personally any complaints about the cattle price for a long time in our bargaining. The hog prices have been improved as the volume is built. Lamb's sheep program was a good example. But it didn't build like it should, but they're building it. You'd have thought everybody would have knocked down the doors to get there. With the direct exports, I told you that we'd improved our position of less cost of about 20 cents a bushel, at least 18 cents. And I'm not going to stand here to try to tell you to go out there and sell on a price advantage. But I'm telling you that what we'll do, you put the volume behind us and we'll lead the prices up when the companies call us. We won't take the same price or a lower price, I can tell you that. And that is a pledge. But without the production to do it with, we can't do it. I want to leave you with a couple of little hints of how you can do it. I think everybody ought to go if they're hogs, producers, cattle, grain, whatever it might be, go by the desk before you leave here tonight and we have forms filled out or blank forms on the production of cost, uh, cost of production forms. Now what can those be used for? I don't know a better thing to give or to use. You don't have to have it. If you don't have it, don't wait till you get one, you know, three months. If you have one in the county, you can reprint them mighty fast. But I don't think there's anything that'll help you more in signing a new member or getting a member to participate or a member to pay their dues and let them figure the cost of production on their own production. And that was brought to mind the other night, and I'm going to call on him in a short time because Montana's coming up here. I don't know what they got in mind, but they're going to sing a little song. And they had the idea there. And I think it's an excellent idea. The other thing is we have to multiply ourselves. Have somebody when they seem favorable. Don't just talk to them. Ask them to get three or four or five more people together. When that night, not a long plan ahead of time. No, not a plan a long ahead of time by any means. Because if you plan a long time ahead for a meeting, I'll guarantee you most of the people will forget when it's going to be. You can do it that morning and have a meeting that night. And you can multiply yourselves that way. And you can multiply yourselves so fast that it will be unbelievable for you to realize how fast it really is. So I want to urge you to realize that you have to multiply yourself and multiply yourself. And the other is the missionaries, where we'll ask some of you or a lot of you, we'll call a leader in 10 county or in one county and say, we want 10 people to go Tuesday morning and stay till Friday morning, each sleep together in the same hotel or motel, and contact the producers in that given county. We won't ask you to do it every week, but we'll ask you to do it several times, maybe this winter. The people that have done it like it, they learn from others. And you go back well instructed. And I want to then try to impress with this one, one time, 
what we're talking about in the commodity Minuteman structure and to show you how it can be done. We've started it in grain. It'll be expanded to other commodities. And would you turn off the lights for just a moment? You've seen it before. I want to impress this on your mind and leave it as a last thought. Can you turn the lights down just a moment? That is a commodity Minuteman structure in grain. I would not want it to be used if it were not for the per point there, area grain director phone. Two things break down volunteer workers that they have to do too much and they can't answer the questions. Everybody on that commodity Minuteman system should be instructed if there's any problems, call the director of grain, the area grain director, and the phone number, and there's a man there that's his aide. We have them in almost every place in the country. That will be a part of bargaining, putting the blocks together and everything else that can answer the questions. If you hear of a problem, instead of trying to answer it, call that number and they'll be calling them to answer it. But the power of that, how many names are on there? Well, you know it because we've been over it several times, haven't we? 66 names. First, it takes one man that Earhart Finkston or lady that Earhart Finkston was talking about in the county that will accept the responsibility of getting four community chairmen. And that's what it is in their own community. Three assistant community chairmen, three assistant community chairmen, and then they have four under them to inventory the grain first, and this is applied to other commodities the same. But what about 66 people that have 15,000 bushel of grain? How much is that, folks? Allowed, how much is it? In a county, isn't it? One million bushel in a county. And we have organization membership in about 13 to 1400 grain counties. A thousand of those counties with a million bushel. What is that, folks? How much? One billion bushel. And how long would it take from this convention and everywhere else to do it? That could be done by the fifth day of January, or Larry, of January while everybody else is having a good time, Christmas and New Year's, and we can still be Christmas and New Year's at home and get it done, can't we, while they're off on vacation, right? And if they came back and there's a billion bushel of grain that had been blown,